Okay. So eat sure HDMI pitch up. Okay. Okay. Um, um mumble mumble. Um let's hope that my video card was not dislodged in a rude way. Um it seems to be detecting it, seems to be happy, but Please ensure HDMI hitch up. Okay, well, I, I think it is hitched up. I think that was just an admonition to myself. Okay. Um, uh, great. Um, so uh, we're going to talk today uh, about... This is my name. This is actually our first lecture and kind of the bigger module of this moment, the continuous coverage. Uh, the first of the three that we're going to be covering with a series of lectures in And for this lecture, I had asked you to pursue an exercise involving causal loop diagrams, right? And I'm, I'm interested in spending time eliciting from you from your understanding from that exercise. Um, but before that, I want to situate us um, and remind us um, of some of system, the system dynamics, uh, even more so than the other methods, um, carries with it a certain philosophy, a certain perspective on the world. It's not merely a technical series of tools or formalisms or sort of ways of describing, you know, um, uh, the world with causal diagram, system structure diagram, socket flow diagram. Although it is that. It's it's more than that. It's kind of a, a way of understanding the world based around two principles. And you folks will remind me of those principles. Can you tell me? Sorry? Okay, stocks and flows are the key building block. So I, you, you're, you're getting, it, it certainly involves stocks and flows. And so one of them, stocks are the embodiment of the concept. What is that? Accumulation. And what's the other one? The other big one, even more important, feedback. feedback. Now, you may wonder why, why feedback. Why do we care about feedback? Why do we care about feedback? It's kind of weird. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Let's see what the model can tell us. See what the model can tell us. Yeah, I mean, broadly, that's that's a lot of the the goal. It's true, and it's a, it's it, Caden's exactly right that it's a source of important emergent behavior. But there's something about feedbacks that 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 lends them an importance. And and I I see Faith has her hand up there. Yeah. Yeah. So so they they're important. They're important sort of components of the interrelations, or they reflect how a lot of things are linked to each other in feedbacks, where A affects B and ultimately B affects A. And so I'll say that you're certainly right, and I won't deny that. I'm looking for something um, a little bit uh, beyond what's been mentioned thus far. And remind me your name? Wahab. Wahab. Yeah. Um, what's your point? Okay, so yeah, I mean, see, when you have feedback, when you have when you have um, variables with feedback, what what what's the hallmark of feedback here? If I, if I drew something up on the board, um, what would you expect to see with the feedback? Would you expect to see if I draw it as a graph? You'd expect to see a what? Uh, speak on, Caden. Changes in accumulation. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's true that accumulations have to be part of the feedback. That is true. All feedbacks have to involve at least one stock and one aspect of the change of the system because we don't have feedback instantaneously in the world. We have feedback, it changes something in the world which ripples back through. It's not like instantaneously, A is two times B and B is the, is the cube root of, is of A or something like that. It's There's actually modification of states. So when the feedback Actually, it's it's a good thing to think about what's the stock here. What's what's being modified in the world here? Um, 
It shouldn't just be logical relationships uh, between things. You don't want to feedback like hours spent spent um, sleeping and hours hours not spent sleeping and do not do this. Do not do this. This, this is full of sound and fury and it signifies nothing in significance where this is negative, this is negative because more hours spent sleeping means fewer hours spent not sleeping and fewer hours not, or more hours spent not sleeping means fewer hours spent sleeping. And so you might think, well, this is a negative connection, this is a negative connection, and therefore it's a positive feedback loop and there's escalating change. I'm tempted to use strong words here, but that's nonsense. Rock, fall through that. Find those comments out of my mouth on the front page of the Star Phoenix uh, from a couple of years ago um, when the minister tried to malign our modeling team using rock. Um, so uh, this is nonsense. This is a logical relationship about the definition of those terms. It's nothing about how the world works. It's just how we define these terms. So this, this is, could someone get a photo of that? Not spent sleeping. Um, hours not spent sleeping. That would be fantastic. Okay. I'm not even sure that you folks can get it. Um, but, we, we do look for accumulations there, but I'm, I'm I'm looking for something else about why feedbacks are important. Jeff, you had your hand up at one point. Well, I was just mentioning that it's going to have a circular path on it, but I mean, that's going to... Uh, yeah, yeah. So so we do expect when we see the... Uh, when when we have a feedback, it's got to have uh, some sort of cycle. That's right. Um, it's a pathway that leads back around... Um, and it's not like one variable is the start and another is the distinguisher, right? I mean, we could say there's a feedback on A here, or there's a feedback around B, and both those are true, you know? Um, good, but the, the fact that feedbacks matter, feedbacks matter to say a first order impacts on systems behavior, technology. They're really influential. And to illustrate that, my wife kindly picking up the airport and I yeah. asked her, could, could you bring that rod? And this is not for disciplinary purposes. Um, <laughs> it's it's uh, to illustrate the importance of feedback. Um, has anyone here ever played balancing something on your on your hand? Any of them consider themselves you know, pretty good at that? Once upon a time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um yeah. Okay. Um so so you'll let me um uh, illustrate uh this principle. So when I was in my youth, I might have done this better, it's true, but uh I will seek to keep this thing aloft without hitting Jeff in his head, right? Right? I could have kept it on for a couple more minutes. Um and but it might have ended in a most memorable way. Um, now you'll notice me moving around. Why was I moving around like that? Counteract. I was countering act. I was counteracting. In order to counteract it, I need to do what? I needed to observe. Right? There was feedback going on. Now, if I weren't allowed to move, what do you think would happen? Yeah, it wouldn't be pretty, right? Uh, and to like demonstrate that, <laughs> okay, you know how it's going to end, right? Um, the only question is whose head will be hit, right? And so I'm going to stop it for occupational health and safety reasons. There's a first order difference in how long one can keep this rod aloft with feedback and without, right? Um, Feedback has a first order impact on the system's behavior. In this case, maintaining a certain, the system close to equilibrium, right? 
And that's how a lot of our systems are. Our thermal balance for our body, keeping us sufficiently warm. Issues with eating, right? Issues of, of, of keeping ourselves hydrated, issues of keeping our bodies salt and balance. In balance. Um, uh, our public health system aims to respond to issues like a foodborne illness outbreak by being locating a source and shutting it down quickly or preventing it from happening in the first place. We deliver vaccines in order to try to keep enough of the population protected that any arrival of that bug within our city will putter out, will will uh, uh, we'll, we'll not lead to spread. We try to keep our system in balance and if something starts going awry, we start getting sick, our body revs up its, its antibodies and its neutrophils and its, and its macrophages and its cytotoxic T lymphocytes, its whole army of different types of immune components to attack it and bring it back into balance. If um, if we develop some condition that requires medical attention, we may have the whole apparatus of the medical system helping helping us manage it. So we use feedback to keep systems try to aim for balance with those systems. Mm -hmm. um, and without that feedback, we'd be in a bad way, right? We wouldn't survive a single year. We wouldn't survive probably a single month without our body constantly keeping these systems in balance. Um, that's for balancing feedback. But reinforcing feedback also has first order impacts on the behavior of systems, whether it's the spread of infection or spread of conspiracy theories or rumors, disinformation, whether it's it's issues having to do with, you know, on uh, campaigns online to victimize someone, or whether it's factors associated with the spread of the emerald ash borer or of the pine beetle in Western Canada. Um, we we can have outbreaks occur, which which take off at fearsome speed and require scrambling. To protect that, and even with with something like viral infection, that's what happens internally in the the free virions. These virus particles multiply, and they infect cells, and the cells undergo lysis, sort of uh, dissolve, and, and the, all these uh, virus particles rush out and infect other cells. And our body needs to have through a negative feedback loop marshal the resources to take that on. And it takes some time to bring it under control. And meanwhile, our viral load has gone really high. We may spread it before it's brought under control, but hopefully it's brought under control before it, you know, ends up, up in a huge fever and, and we pass away. So whether it's at the microscopic level, the macroscopic level, the societal level, feedbacks, deleterious or favorable, have huge impacts. And there are deleterious feedbacks that are negative feedbacks that trap people in cycles of poverty or addiction and there are deleterious and there are favorable uh, negative feedbacks associated with keeping us in balance I'll be with you in a moment um, Mr. Shai. um and so negative feedback can be beneficial or it can be deleterious and positive feedback can be deleterious or beneficial you know we we want positive feedback associated with our immune system, marshalling its resources to take on a new invader, for example. Um, and uh, that's something that, you know, we we value. Um, we value efforts to train public health nurses so they can respond to uh, emerging crisis by having trained the trainer schemes with grow, growing numbers of people. So sometimes positive feedback can be desirable. Sometimes it can be it can be undesirable, but all of these shape system behavior in big ways. And that's why with system dynamics, even before we build causal, or excuse me, we build stock flow diagrams, which involve stocks characterizing accumulation and, and, uh, and often involve feedbacks as almost invariably involve feedbacks as part of it. 
Even before that, we built causal loop diagrams to capture knowledge and where feedbacks are front and center. Um, a, a, a point of attention. Yes, Mr. Deshaun. We're not really after balance per se, so what is negative balance like? There can be negative. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so there can be balance that's very undesirable. Yeah, and endemic equilibrium is what you're referring to, where you know, um, an infection that could be very undesirable, like syphilis, um, could stay at a high level circulating the population, and it's it may be kind of in a form of adverse stasis. Um, undesirable spaces where roughly the number of new infections is equal to the number of recoveries, but that doesn't make it desirable at all, right? And similarly, when we talk about lock-in effects where the system takes a lot of effort to get out than it did to get in, often, almost invariably, those involve a negative a feedback, a balancing feedback that sort of keeps it in this state makes it hard to get out of it, right? And that could be very undesirable associated with uh, substance use, for example. Um, if that's uh, had reminded us one or two lectures ago, that there can be adverse effects associated with that that are balancing, but not necessarily desirable. Um, and in general, when we're dealing with nonlinear systems, um, often we'll have di different equilibria. We'll have certain equilibria um, what are called basins of attraction, where in certain regions of the system state, the, the state of the system, I think the value of all the stocks and system dynamics, you may get into kind of one type of, of say stable situation. Another, maybe you'll see limit cycles. So it cycles around something. It's not perfectly imbalanced, but it it cycles around us. Where do we see this in life with sort of cycles going on that are persistent and they're healthy cycles, but it's not in perfect balance. We see them physiologically, we see them in, in you know, systems in the world with animal populations, uh, classic one being hares and lynx in Northern Canada, the Hudson Bay Company, you know, noted early on these, these cycles in the, in the, snowshoe hare population, um, followed by cycles in the, in the lynx population, often at, at much lower levels. And we'll be talking about that in class. But these systems often have different points where they're kind of in balance. Um, maybe one of the TAs can get this graph. And, and these are different basins of attraction eating. It's kind of like, has anyone here been to the Columbia ice fields? Okay. Um, great. So if you've been near the Columbia ice fields, you may know that it's close to the continental divide, meaning there's a point there where within a couple of hundred meters going one way or the other way, a drop of water going one side will go down to the Pacific Ocean. Going down another side, it will go down to the Arctic Ocean. Going another side, it will go down to Hudson Bay. Um, you know, uh, on the uh, far east, northeastern side of Manitoba, north of Ontario, western Ontario. And actually in southern Saskatchewan, there, there's also another point, um, and I think there's others in Alberta, where a drop will go down to the Gulf of Mexico. And these are different basins of attraction, right? And, it, and you could think of like putting a, a system in this state, think of it as like a drop of water here, it might go down and go to this point. This is like maybe, you know, the Pacific Ocean. Like you put a drop of water here, it may go and get into a cycle around this. This is like going to the Arctic Ocean. And, and you know, here it may go extinct. And that's that's uh, a, a, an equilibrium where it, um, um, where, you know, we might analogize it going once a day or something like that. And the point is, um, just as in the world, we have these kind of basins of attraction where, you know, they can be butt up against one another and, and go in different directions. So it is with our dynamical systems. People can get in different states. And and there's there's real human needs associated with this and organizational needs. Um, 
I, I know I weave in a lot of health examples here, and there are some very troubling health examples where, you know, a, a child exposed to adverse life experiences early may end up in in a position that ha involves high stress and, you know, a uh, lot of allostatic load, a lot of load in their body and, and, and mental health um, challenges, dealing with adversity, end up in a life of great difficulty. Whereas if only we invested in them early, could have stopped those childhood traumas, they could have been much healthier. Or they could be in a state that's basically pretty healthy, but um, but still involves, you know, some some struggles, but maybe, you know, they have um, good employment prospects and a stable family. They, they just are, are still dealing with um, with some unprocessed trauma or what have you. And so when, when we're dealing at a, at, a, at a level societally, we get different outcomes possible. And a lot of our job in our systems from public policy perspective is to kind of nudge it towards the healthy side and try to avoid ending up people in, in adversity. Uh, relationships between couples could be like this. Um, you know, uh, a man or a woman or two women or two men, um, whatever the, the relationship status, um, you know, there can be there can be adverse relationships. Um, uh, there can be relationships that are basically quite harmonious. There can be others that involve stresses, but but are resilient and bring people back together um, and never any violence. And and these are different uh, basins of attraction that you you um, want to be aware of at a relationship level. Um, uh, at the level of uh, organization, software engineering, <laughs> software engineering teams can end up in different situations. This might be a situation where um, the team has, and we'd have to plot what the axes are, right? This might be um, turnover, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, so so this this might be uh, retention, um, re retention, uh, yes, uh, of of team members, um, and this might be um, you know uh, something like um, uh, customer satisfaction or something like that, or maybe you could have co based quality. But the point is, like, same software engineering team with different manager. Uh, decisions might end up in situations of strong adversity, um, where the code base quality goes to hell, and you know um, you've got low morale among the members, and people are quitting, and and the best people are just tearing their hairs out. Um, the, the folks with most knowledge of the of the, the the code base are few and far between, and they're overworked and. They got to spend their time trying to train people and trying to hire new people to replace them. And there's enough loss of people. There's a large documentation burden because all everything has to be written down because people are walking out the door pretty frequently. And it, it's really a difficult place to work. Customers unhappy. On the other hand, you can have a gel team where people value working there, uh, where morale is high, where the code base quality is high, where things don't have to be written down often nearly as much and as, as you know, uh, with huge investments in documentation because people know the code base very well and there's low turnover uh, where customers are happy and you get support for hiring the best people and the best people want to work on that team because they understand it produces quality product and because the hours are reasonable and the demands are reasonable. And a lot of managerial decision-making can shift a, a project from one area to the other. For example, one of the biggest mistakes you can make in software engineering is, is focus just on the obvious numbers that happen to be collected on things like the, you know, the number of lines of code being written per day or the number of, um, of bugs there punish people for for reporting bugs, for example. It leads to all sorts of perverse consequences, people hiding bugs, hiding the fact they discovered quality problems and undermining the ability to make judicious decisions about prioritizing work. Or you get managers who say, we're behind, no vacation time, no time off. No, you can't you know, take your weekends off. 
and and that undercuts the balancing feedbacks that developers need in order to recuperate, in order to come back into balance in terms of their life, work balance, et cetera. And so project, project teams, um, same project team members might end up in very different situations based on decision making. So a lot of systems that we work with, uh, Mr. Deshadi, have different balances, some adverse, some desirable. With infectious diseases, a very desirable balance is where we have a stable disease-free equilibrium for public health situation. You don't want measles in your community, and you want the system to be stable enough, like with enough vaccination, that even if you have someone coming into town with active case of measles, it won't spread. That you want a disease-free equilibrium. It's in balance and it resists perturbation, resists being pushed out of this. If it's pushed out, like someone comes into town with measles, it will bounce back to this because it won't spread. Um, and that's what we try to build is resilient healthcare systems. Um, but you know, the alternative is if you're not careful with public health, it can be in a situation where measles is circulating. It's in a sort of perverse balance, but that's not a desirable one because kids are getting sick and hospitalized. Uh, you may have, you know, look for pertussis. Um, kids could be dying, you know, little babies could be dying in the hospital uh, because of it. And, and it's a tragedy. And so we try to find equilibria that are desirable and nudge the system towards those equilibria. Hope that's helpful. Mm. Yeah. And we saw some of these with some of the models we've done in plan. Remember that model where we had to have more clinics if 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 the cat got out of the bag? Remember that? Um if remember the, the whole notion that a stitch in time saves nine, uh an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we invested early, mm -hmm. you know, just two or two or three clinics could head off the infection. But if we invested late. Um, and we're left picking up the pieces because the infection went to a high level. We needed, you know, six clinics to bring it back, or seven, or what have you. Um, the, these are situations where we want it to be extinct. That's an equilibrium. It's a particularly desirable equilibrium. Um, but another one is it's just staying at very high levels, and, and that was a form of equilibrium. So, okay. Okay. Uh, yes. No. Yeah, I mean, is there any study into like finding these watershed locations between huh? various cat bases? Yeah. And do they have a term for? Oh, yeah. Yeah, these are called uh, variously, uh, they go by various names. So, equilibrium points um, is one of the most common. Uh, uh, they are sometimes termed fixed points. Um, which is a somewhat different notion of fixed point than with a recur uh, a recurrence relation, but um, it's related to that fixed points. Um, uh, they will sometimes be called critical points as well um, by some parts of literature. But one of the advantages of a stock and flow model and having a, a set of, um, say, differential equations, ordinary differential equations behind it, you can find the locations of these. And you can find how the locations of these and their stability, how much they bounce back if they're disturbed. Um, you can find how that depends on model parameters. And so you can say, you know, gosh, if we could, we could, we could find people with this illness faster. We could reduce the amount of time it takes to diagnose someone with the illness. If we could lower the contact rate, if we could vaccinate more people, how would that affect the location of this equilibrium? And you can actually do that analysis and, and not even have to run the model for many of these uh, cases. You can do that for sufficiently simple models. Um, there currently is no way to do that with agent-based models, but we are putting in place mathematical frameworks that, that will move agent-based modeling to the point where you might be able to, down the road, do some analysis like that. Further mm. questions? Why I think that really want to get back. It's a sort of sort of uh, opportunities. 
Yeah. Well, I love being able to, to be able to keep another screen. Okay, any any questions about that? I want to talk about uh causal loop value. But any any questions related to what I've spoken on what I've spoken about so far? Okay. Um can't help but want to use that stick point. Um but um you TS got this. Um, I'm so grateful for their photographic exertions. Okay. Um, sleep, sleep, and undergraduates. Let's talk about some variable. So well, we only have about 20 minutes, but you can tell me what. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. We're gonna have to get one of those owl devices or something um, to yeah. follow me around. Um, the body fan might be fun. Go from, yeah, go from, from, yeah. <laughs> you can touch to your forehead if you have a basically bit of seat. Yeah, that could really help with the with the uh, academic misconduct. Oh. Um, very quiz. True. Tell me, thank you. I would have. Some pretty salutarious balancing feedback success. Done. Okay, let's work on that for fun. Um, <laughs> this class is reported, it's already noted in the syllabus. I don't like Um, I fell off the trip truck yesterday. Um, no, it was the day before. Um, okay, so um, factors affecting the sleep of undergraduates. Uh, you you came up, you you worked on this. You hopefully put your efforts into it. What what was a variable? Come come out with some some variables in, in your diagram. Caffeine consumption. Caffeine consumption, right? Okay. Um let me let me get my coffee over here. Um okay. uh another? Yes. Uh and I eat yes, time spent on social media. Um I'll, I'll write it S M. Yes. Uh Malcolm. Stress level? Okay, stress level. Um by the way, any any direct con connection? I'm I'm not saying a big connection, but I don't I don't know the lives of, of contemporary youths well, and so you're gonna have to ground me if there's some, you know, like I I hear there's a, a perverse gaming culture where people like vape for hours on end, and and so maybe there's something about when you do social media, you're you're just like <laughs> <laughs> anybody. Um, okay, welcome. Say that again. Uh, stress level. Stress level. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Stress level. Okay. Um, I could try to pause it. Um, any connections? Because remember, when we're describing systems in the world, um, uh, complex systems are as much about the connections as they are about the pieces. So these are great things to put forward, these noun phrases. But what we're all also want to be thinking about carefully is connections between things. Is there any is there anything that one might posit between uh, here? So I see uh, Mr. Dushadi has his hand up. So stress level and time stamp on social media. Okay, so no. which direction is the positive cause? The more on your stress, the more time you spend on social media. You look at the company. Okay. Okay, so so I'll I'll put a plus there. Um, and uh, back in the corner, name. Us uh, uh Yes. So, okay, I've Okay. Ah, okay. So I'm going to try to situate this in not a terrible place. So academic deadlines. Um. Like if you have a causal diagram to do tomorrow or, or do like in five minutes and um yeah. hoping the plane will be delayed. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so academic deadlines, how do they affect, is it a plus or a minus? Plus, okay, and you posit it relates to caffeine consumption, which direction? Yeah, no, so probably caffeine consumption is not affecting the deadlines, um, at least not consumption on your part. Yes, um, so Malcolm, yes. Yeah, so maybe courses per semester would be positively uh, influencing your stress level and the number of academic deadlines. Okay, courses, um, maybe I'll say being taken, something like that, um, or course load. Often we 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 try to keep keep it free for it's possible without sacrificing meeting. Um, so something like this, where would it? So so this was a plus here. Is this plus or minus? Uh, plus, yeah, more course load, more stress. Oh, okay, more course load, more that uh, deadlines. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, okay. Can anyone help me work towards building a feedback loop, identifying a feedback loop? I'm not. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. I love it. Love it. Okay. I, not that I love that effect, but I love the I, I love the suggestion. Yes. Um caffeine consumption leading to insomnia. Uh, so, so that's, for those not familiar with the word, it refers to inability to sleep, uh, difficulty sleeping, um, and, and, and insomnia potentially leading to, you were saying, uh, right, okay, so there's a quality of sleep we might, we might, uh, have here. Now, when we have variables in these models, generally, um, it, it turns out human reasoning tends to be uh, uh, it, it tends to be challenged by negatives in ways that are that are um, worth remembering. It's 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 not that we can't have negatives in the diagram. It's just we have to be cautious that if you start saying like less of a negative, people people have trouble thinking about it. So I'm going to say sleep quality here, and I'm going to say insomnia does what to sleep quality? It is it minus or positive? Minus, good, okay. So the more insomniac I am, the lower my sleep quality will be compared to what it otherwise would have been, all other things being equal. Now, it, as you're putting together diagram, you may wonder why I've been muttering this term, all other things being equal. It's sometimes because there are multiple pathways that are, that are impinging on these things. And sometimes a given variable might directly affect it, but it affects other things which are affected. You want to be thinking about that, that particular uh, pathway. And this leads back, I'll be with you in a moment, Cersei. So this leads back to what? Caffeine. Okay. So caffeine consumption with a plus or a minus. So if sleep quality is higher, it'll tend to lead to somewhat less caffeine consumption. So, and, and this light from caffeine consumption to insomnia, is it a plus or a minus? Plus. Okay, so we have a plus, a minus, and a minus. The net effect is a what? A plus, right? Because a minus times a minus is a plus times this plus. So this is a plus loop. And I'm not um, merits, uh, uh, you know, uh, praise for having elicited our first loop. This is important. This is a potential vicious cycle that people can get in, right? Um, where their sleep is impaired, uh, partly, and they use caffeine uh, to, to try to deal with the consequences of that and develop worse insomnia and impairs the sleep more in it and it cycles. Um, okay, seriously, how do you promise? Uh, I, have, I think to relate to the media to that, it already exists uh, sunlight exposure and melatonin production. Excellent. Okay, okay. So, there's a question on on where do we? I think you would go into sleep quality with no melatonin production, uh, but the terms of the social media would have the effect on the sun exposure. Okay. Um, and the sun exposure affects your melatonin it's level. A direct, yeah. 
So, so I think what you're saying, yeah. So, so the time out spent on social media, um, the, the positive connection. Remember, these are positive. They're postulated. They're hypothesized connections. So we're not, we're not all expected to agree on this. I'm not expecting you to be immediately knowledgeable, but I'm trying to capture what I'm hearing voices wise, and we can then discuss it. So, so here, this would be melatonin, melatonin um, uh, production. And I think you were saying that time spent on social media might directly. Well, you probably get less sun, but also if you're on social media late at night and you're blue screen, that's also going to decrease melatonin production. Okay, so so th so there might be some effect through kind of um, blue light exposure or something like that. Um, blue light exposure. Um, if for those noticing, I'm, you know, we're dealing with the strictures of locating things on boards. It's hard to move. This is why we. We have this Google Doc-like system for, for doing this live for moving things around and so on. Um, so time spent on social media leads to more blue light exposure, which leads to less melatonin production, the idea. And then, uh, but didn't spill. Um, and then there's uh, time spent on social media, which might lower sunlight exposure. Mm -hmm. And that also, um, might affect or might impair or excuse me, affects melatonin production, sunlight exposure. And this link, the more sunlight you have, does it lead to more of melatonin? More, more, yeah. Okay, so sunlight leads to serotonin. Okay, so this would be like a plus. This is like a minus here. So I know this is it's hard to read and I apologize. Um and these might affect sleep so the better the melatonin production it will tend to help or hurt sleep quality uh, it, uh the better the melatonin production will assist uh, sleep quality okay so a, a plus there okay so now we're 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 actually seeing okay there's there's something going on here and it's linking in here i don't think it's yet it's, there, there's not a loop back here, but we've added another pathway by which stress levels through time spent on social media might might affect things. Um, uh, and and so impair uh, sleep quality. Um, so I think there's still only one one loop here, but this is this is explicating some things in a way we might start to think about another loop that's yes oh um, i think we need to name the channel from keeping an hour from sleep quality to stress level aha uh aha -huh. uh -huh. um okay right now we have a link back from sleep quality to caffeine consumption i think what you're postulating is that there might be one kind of coming like that sorry for that for that or for quality something like that in so the higher sleep quality, the how does does that if I have higher sleep quality, does is my stress level higher than it otherwise would have been, or is it lower? Lower. lower. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if we had that, we have this one here back minus plus plus minus. So this would be what sort of loop? So again, minus. Plus, and this is all to one variable here, plus, minus, plus. So it's a net mm -hmm. positive. It's a potentially, again, a vicious cycle where stress level is higher. I spend more time on social media. I, I have more blue light exposure and less sunlight exposure. Those are sort of two different pathways by which using this might affect them. Um, I uh, I lower melatonin product production. It affects it, it adversely impacts my sleep quality and boosts my my stress levels uh, further. Um, yeah, so I think we're we're gonna have to finish up with just a few minutes. But uh, see, you can see on this one? Yeah, I just have another one for the caffeine. It was like caffeine tolerance, and it just kind of loops with itself. Yeah, because you have more caffeine in the morning. Yeah, caffeine consumption. So the the caffeine tolerance. So I need more. Um, 
caffeine uh, tolerance. Uh, I, 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 I'm not really knowledgeable about this, but I guess I, I recently heard that like some people use certain coffee types, like someone said, oh, it's not crap coffee is the right level. And I got that sense. So it's like, it's like, you know, turbocharged caffeine or something. So, so there may be some people that consume enough, their caffeine tolerance goes up and therefore they end up needing, uh, they need more. Um, so, um, so, so as their tolerance level goes up, they will end up consuming more coffee to, to sort of compensate for that. And I could, you know, I could break this up further with variables like desired level of, you know, um, of impact on the coffee that would mitigate, it would, would show this, but the idea is that you have escalating need for coffee. Um, something like that, or or caffeine. Um, yes, Daniel. I was going to say um, <clears throat> for stress level to be yeah. exercising. Yeah. Ah. Better quality of sleep. Okay. Okay. So this might be physical activity or moderate, you know, vigorous physical activity or something like that. Physical activity. Um. And uh. I'll, I'll put in vigorous, uh, like cardiovascular or activity or what have you, and or, or cardio uh, activity, and this would lead to improved sleep quality, something like that. Yeah. Um, so vigorous, uh, and this would be stress level leads to more or less of this. That's more. Um, yeah, and, and then this leads to, so higher fig, uh, vigorous physical activity leads to better or worse quality, better. And then there's a negative feedback loop back to stress level, which means this is a net what loop. Negative, it's a balancing loop. Someone takes this, uh, take, chooses to exert uh, to to invest in physical activity to help compensate for the stress levels in a more healthy way that improves sleep quality and lower stress levels. Now there are limits to all of these things, and I can sense this is a topic of some currency, um, which is is great. Um, uh, we we only have uh, one or so minutes left, but anyone um, want to? I saw Malcolm stand up, and I see Francisco's. And uh, name again? Braden. Braden. Um, okay, so um, uh, maybe we'll go in that order, Malcolm. Sure, just as a practical side. But in this case, now we've created a pathway from stress, creates a positive to vigorous activity, which creates that. So, wouldn't then an increase in stress by this pathway cause an increase in sleep quality? So, an increase in stress, and let's I read this wrong, increase in stress level would lead to. What this posits is that will lead to someone to invest in higher levels of physical activity, um, higher levels of physical that it would have been otherwise, um, you know, compared to the value what otherwise would have been, and not going to say all that. Um, and that ripples around to better sleep quality, and then that better sleep quality lowers stress levels through this pathway. I see. Okay. So it's a, it's a plus plus minus. It, it's it's like I read it there. Um, you know, Francisco. Yeah, I had a question. Um, when do we stop? <laughs> yeah, this. that's a it's a great question, and we threw this down quickly. Um, what what you will find is that actually there's some refactoring that needs to go on because sometimes they'll say, really, that's kind of blunt. Can we divide this into two pieces, or or really maybe we could sharpen that to mean specifically this or something? And you end up refactoring a fair bit of this. Um, one thing that's very important is that you have some purpose in mind. And sometimes what you do, if, if, you, if you have an area of that, like potentially online behavior will be one example, um, online um, activity. Um, there may be certain areas where they merit their own diagram, right? And and you focus in on a diagram, focusing more on this area and another one focusing on this area. But generally speaking, you want to be cautious about anything that gets over, you know, uh, one or two dozen variables, just because it can get a bit overwhelming. Now, I do, do I own Tiger more than that? I absolutely do. And there's mixed feelings about, like some people actually 
find them very eye-opening to see it all put together in a in a systematic way. Other people's eyes glaze over. And I'll see if I can show you examples for this. It's not a it's it's not a an area where I'm aware of any hard and fast rules. I think it gets into human computer interface issues, you know, like what's at what point does it stop being a learning aid, a learning tool, and start just confusing us, right? Um, and uh, and I, I've got to say that's somewhat mediated by how you interact with these things and to what degree you can zoom out. So we we have work going on, and Jen is aware of this, you know, which, for example, um, could help aggregate parts down, collapse parts down into pieces, and make it hierarchical, so you could zoom in on a certain part of it, for example, or aggregate up to zoom out and then go and, and see, you know, some areas in more in more detail. There's a lot of a lot of um a lot to learn, I think, how we can do these things better. But I saw it, uh, a, a hand up from Braden. I uh, I'm just gonna bring it with uh, my brains, at least. Ah yeah. So so people seeking to exert intentional regulation and, and managing of their melatonin and it's it's a chronic thing it's not like they just take it to recover from bad lag like that they flown in from <laughs> yeah more like well, no, yeah not, not today um but um yes uh, okay so that's and we we could add that there's clearly a feedback associated with that right and um and there could be sometimes some perverse feedback so we'll try to capture this i really like what went on today and i want to thank everyone for contributing to this um this is a topic jenna and i have some uh considerable research interest in and we work with uh, a sleep researcher Who's also interested in a system view of it? And if anyone's really interested in it, talk with talk with us. We look forward to reviewing your diagrams. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just want to highlight. Um, although we did this really quick, like I I hope you can understand why sometimes it's really good to have people from different backgrounds and lived experiences and kind of knowledge and perspectives on issues in the same room so because sometimes there's different subcultures I, I didn't know about chronic melatonin supplement taking um you know as a as as something that goes on and sometimes you really learn things by bringing up these diagrams so it's remember it's not the model it's the model it's this discussion back and forth and the sort of sessions Jenna runs, which might run much of a day or something and bring together people from different backgrounds, you can often develop understanding from those that are richer, and then you can have groups of sub subgroups from that to discuss some issues more. This is an important part of, of capturing understanding of the domain, and it is a component of modeling practice. And next time I'll talk a bit about why these are not merely sign graphs. Um, there's a compositionality there, and there's the ability to reason about analytically what we're producing here and to relate it systematically to things like stock and flow diagrams, um, systematically related to more quantitative models. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that um, next time, and we'll also talk about ways in which these feedbacks turning to appear in stock and flow mode. So thank you very much. The trip, I'm glad to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Uh, pardon me, I'm just going to pause.